welcome to the Times of Canada. Thank you for taking out the time out of your busy schedule and coming here today to uh, talk about um, the current events and talking about yourself. And uh, our viewers would love to hear from you. So uh, I'd like to start with uh, welcoming you and uh, would like to know uh, a little bit about yourself, about your history, your journey so far. Well, thank you. And I really want to commend Times of Canada as well because you have become uh, an integral part of our community, whether it's the Diwali, celebrations or whether it's Vasaki and through the media now as well. Yeah. And uh, talking about my journey, I suppose it's the journey of uh, many immigrant families. Uh, my father emigrated to England uh, when I was about probably six years old. And uh, he uh, then sent for us. And when I was nine, my mother from India to England. From India to England. Okay. So I was born in a small village called Padma in uh, near Nurmel in Jalandhar district. And I mm. went to a little village school there. I did my five first five classes there. Yeah. And uh, then my uh, father sent for the rest of us. So I have three brothers at the time and myself and my mother. So in 1962, we uh, traveled to England. And it was a very uh, scary journey. I didn't want to leave. Uh, I was sort of well loved by grandparents and uncles and aunts and didn't want to leave them. But we got to England and it was the month of October. Very cold, very rainy, very miserable. And for me, one of my clearest images is when we were leaving Heathrow Airport and driving to Leamington Spa, where I did my schooling, I was so amazed at the shape of the roofs. They were slanting the roofs. Peaked roofs, yeah. Peaked roofs. And I was started to cry thinking, do I have to live in one of those? You know, it was, plus it was cold. And uh, even though I wanted to see my dad, I hadn't seen him for a long time. And uh, lots of other um, people were in the van had come to meet us as well. I see. Yeah. So it was a very uh, cold transition into England. And then from England over to Canada? Well, I went to school in England. I did elementary school. And in those days, there were not that many families from India. Uh, so at school, I was the only one. In the elementary school, I had two of my brothers with me. I see. But when I transferred to a secondary <clears throat> school a year later, I was the only one. And it was another couple of years before other people from India started to arrive or from Africa. And they had no ESL in those days. So you were literally put into a class. And I can honestly say I spent the first few months sleeping <laughs> because when you don't understand the language, right. that's what you do. It's a challenge. Uh, but the teachers were wonderful. So were the students and they really made try to involve me and in everything, invited me to their birthday parties, even though I didn't speak English. And um, I was good at sports, so that helped. And then the English came fairly quickly. So uh, what motivated you to get into politics then? Well, I'm not sure I was ever motivated to get into politics. Uh, I uh, became a teacher in England. And when Margaret Thatcher got elected, a really right-wing government, I really didn't want to stay there. So we just came to Canada for a year or two. We got offered jobs in Quebec. We lived in Quebec for two years. And then we came to see BC, and then we were going to fly back to England. But we fell in love with BC, and we decided to make it our home. So my husband and I, in 1977, arrived on Vancouver Island in Nanaimo. Oh, in Nanaimo. Yeah, and we got teaching jobs there, both of us. <clears throat> and that's where my daughter grew up, and then my son was born, and he grew up. And now my grandchildren live there. And Doesn't look like it. You, you look so <laughs> young yourself. <laughs> well, thank you very much. But um, so we came to BC by accident, I, I would say. But we chose to make BC our home. We loved the education system back right. in the 70s. Uh, we really fell in love with the geography and the people. We loved the multiculturalism. There wasn't the class system here at the time that we had seen in England. Uh, one of the things that amazed us when we were in Nanaimo or in Quebec is whether you were the owner of the company, whether you were a judge, a teacher, an engineer, or whether you were the garbage collector or whether you worked uh, at building homes. Everybody socialized together. Yeah. And we no love equal uh, platform. And because it was a multicultural place, I wanted my children to grow up where they weren't going to have some of the challenges we were beginning to see in England with the emergence of the National Front, 
especially in the Bradford area. So we decided this is where we were going to raise our children and I became a teacher. And you can say teaching took me into social justice activism, though I was activist even when I was at school. And it's that activism that eventually took me into politics. I think it's no secret that everybody knows I'm passionate about public education. And um, I had been a very loud spoken critic of government from the 80s on, uh, whether it was NDP or the Liberals. Yeah. And in the 2002 on, I would say the BCTF, when I was president of the BCTF, was um, almost like the unofficial opposition for a number of years to government as I watched uh, the Liberal government decimate public education not build schools, <clears throat> strip teachers' contracts, which removed uh, over 4,000 teachers from the classroom, took away support from special needs kids, took away ESL, took away support for adult education. And that, you know, you asked me a question earlier, what made me become an activist? Because I realized that if you want to fight for the kids, fight for a better future for them, that what you actually have to do is get engaged in a policy setting. So. You were a member of parliament before um, uh, from the Surrey area, uh, and I think you uh, defeated the uh, uh, reigning uh, or the current uh, member of parliament back in the day. Um, now you're a local member of the Legislative Assembly, MLA, from the uh, Surrey, uh, I believe, Panorama area. Um, any aspirations to get back into federal politics? You know what? I'm loving what I'm doing. And uh, I loved my time as a member of parliament. It was truly amazing. I got to work with Jack Layton, one of my old time iconic favorites. Yes. Uh, I got to work with uh, Tom Mulcair, mm -hmm. and he taught me a lot as well. And an amazing group of uh, caucus members. But I also got to be the critic for Jason Kenney for yeah. a long, long time. And. Uh, I got to hold some amazing files and I loved the work I did then and I <clears throat> loved Surrey because I was new moving into Surrey and what I love about Surrey is it has reconnected me with my Punjabi, it has reconnected me with a lot of the cultural roots, roots. Yeah. because you know when you grew up in England, when I grew up there was not that many Indian families around, they came later. I kept my Punjabi because I was everybody's interpreter, letter writer, take them to the doctors, uh, take them uh, of course. to register their kids at school. So my Punjabi was there. But it's only when I became a teacher, president of the BC Teachers Federation that I expanded my vocabulary. And then when I came to live in Surrey, Surrey has definitely uh, played a major role, the amazing people here right. in improving my Punjabi right. and giving me a, a different perspective which uh, means a lot to me. Yeah. So in your current capacity, what are your roles and responsibilities uh, at this time? Well, right now I get to be a minister in John Hogan's NDP government, and it's a very, very exciting time. And right now I get to be the minister for citizen services. Everybody thinks it's citizenship. Right. I have to tell everybody citizenship <laughs> is federal. Okay, this is services for citizens of British Columbia. Correct. So we have 65 service BC centers. They are all over the province. So any service you require from the uh, provincial government, you have to go through my ministry. All the call centers are in my ministry. All the information technology is there, cyber security, freedom of information. People say I'm the landlady of the province because all the properties of course. are in my ministry as well. The land title. Yeah, plus uh, procurement which is one of the biggest uh, enablers to support small and medium-sized businesses and supporting tech, the tech sector to grow in BC as well. So when you think of my ministry, people talk about it as being the face of government, where people come in to get their services, but we're also the backbone of government because we help to support all other ministries to do their work. And we have some pretty big files in the ministry as well. So you mentioned schools and uh, your association with schools as a, in the teacher capacity. 
Um, there is a lot of schools that are in portables, and I know John Horgan, uh, Premier John Horgan, was here recently, and you, uh, it was on the in, in the news as well, where uh, you you folks were in a school in Sullivan uh, and taking kids out of portables and building schools. I think for twenty twenty, um, for the twenty twenty session. Uh, for kids to be in regular classrooms. But there is so many other schools other than the Sullivan, uh, all across Surrey, all across the Lower Mainland even for, uh, furthermore, uh, where uh, students don't have uh, full adequate resources. Uh, they're still in, uh, uh, in, in um, portables. Uh, my son goes to Chimney Hill Elementary and he's still in portable and he's unfortunately gonna be graduating way before your 2020 uh, deadline, so. 16 long years. For 16 long years, the BC Liberals under Gordon Campbell and then Christy Clark, failed to invest in schools, not just in Surrey, but right across this province. When you look at Sook, you look at Saanich, you look at other parts of the province, Kelowna, they are portables, yeah. lots of portables. And building schools takes time. And if you look at the number of projects that we have announced in the last 18 months, it's far more than was even announced under the previous government. Right. But we're not just making announcements. We're actually starting to build those schools. There's been lots of shovels in the ground already. So far, we have announced funding for 7,000 seats. That's a lot for Surrey alone. Yes. But is it enough? No. no. Because when we ran to form government, we committed to get the 7,000 students who were sitting in portables into classrooms. And that we have announced already, and the building and the planning is on the way. Some are shovels in the ground, some are at the building stage, planning stage, some are at the procurement stage. But they are all in process. They're not just sitting on paper somewhere. They're actually active projects. But what happened in the meantime is the teachers won their court case at the Supreme Court, which was a big day for celebration for teachers, for students, and for parents. And I would say for public education. And with that, we had to hire three and a half thousand more teachers. So when you hire those 3,600 teachers, you needed more classrooms. This includes the special needs teachers, yes, the regular yes, teachers, yes. So and what happened education is, assistants and all What that. happened is we had to create, buy even more portables. So that increased the portable numbers way above the 7,000 that were there at the time. Right. Plus, as you know, Surrey is one of the fastest growing cities. And we get hundreds of people coming in each month. So every month it's growing. We're building as fast as is humanly possible. In order to fast track for Surrey, we have a special project office just in Surrey, where we've got a director in charge right in Surrey. So they're not having to go backwards and forwards uh, five or six different times. Right. Everybody is working very hard. And I want to commend the current school board and the current mayor for helping us to expedite this. We can provide the money, but as you know, governments don't build things. Building is done by uh, doing procurement. Okay. And we are doing that properly and we're getting into the way. And the school we announced, the expansion, is a huge expansion for Sullivan and we know it's needed there. And the shovels are going to be in the ground in the next two months. So it's not something that's going to happen in the far distance future. We are building schools not just here in Surrey, in Quenelle, in Sook, in Nanaimo, you name it, it's happening right over. And $2.7 billion is going into building schools into the capital project of schools alone. And that this is, is province wide. And that is a big, big investment, as you can imagine, for, uh, for a government. And in Surrey alone, so far, the announcements have come to over half a billion dollars. And that's a big, big commitment from our part. And we're going to continue to build schools. Uh, I'm a teacher. Is it perfect yet? No. No. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that for the first time in 16 long years, we do have a government that is committed to building schools opening libraries, providing supports for special needs students, and making sure the teachers have the supports they need. On top of that, we knew parents were having to sell Christmas wrap and do fundraising by baking cakes in order to build playgrounds. Playgrounds are not a luxury in a school. They're a necessary part of a child's development. The 
part of your physical development. As we know, there's emotional, there's physical, there's social, and there's intellectual development. That physical development is just as important, and I'm so proud of the uh, funding that has been allocated to build school playgrounds and get them up to par. Appreciate that. Um, the next couple of questions are, are sort of more of the vision of the NDP party as a whole in general. So uh, they're not necessarily uh, at a local level. They might be federal, they might be uh, provincial. Um, so the, the gas prices seems to be a very sore topic these days. Uh, dollar, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it was dollar seventy-eight point nine this morning um, for regular unleaded. Uh, that is the highest in North America. Now, some are saying that this is because of the NDP's carbon tax, it's, it's added to that, and so on and so forth. Um, there was a news article recently that said it's not necessarily the NDP, it was actually uh, with things that happened that, that was done by the Liberal Party, and that this is the result of that. But yes, the NDP is not helping it. What would you like to say about that? Well, first of all, we all know why we have a carbon tax. The carbon tax is there so that we can um, discourage the usage of private vehicles and burning all that oil, the gasoline, and so that we can protect Mother Earth. That's one of our goals, and that's why our government is making major investments into public transit as well. But driving is a reality of life. I know that I can't, from where I live, get onto a bus and move around. I would need about three hours to get here alone. Right, right. So it's not practical. No, it's not practical. And you know, using cars is a reality of life right now. And every one of us is concerned about the price of gas because it has an impact on what you have left to spend on food and everything else that you spend on as a family. But I think the liberals are being very disingenuous with all their advertisements and their social media, trying to put it all on John Hogan. On April the 1st, gas prices went up one cent a litre, one cent a litre, uh, due to the carbon tax increase. Uh, very little compared to the carbon tax increase, as you know, in the other provinces. Mm -hmm. So one cent. And immediately, uh, what I watched down King George, is I saw gas prices vary from $1.28 to $1.67 in one day, in one day. Now, some gas stations justified, oh, it's going up by one cent. Let's use that as a chance to hike it up to 168. Others stayed at 128. And if you look at the last week or two, it fluctuates anywhere from 128 now to 170 More something. between 149 and 179. Yeah. Perhaps. But there are a couple of gas stations that have gone down there because I look at V-Day now. And so it's very simplistic to try to blame it on one level of government or another. I think the uh, gas station owners, as well as the oil refineries, have a role to play in this as well. We're being told right now that the refineries are on a slowdown because they're on maintenance. That could be part of it. But it seems ironic to me, and I think this is where the public is much smarter than uh, some of the social media would have them believe, is that the government puts up carbon tax by one, and the companies immediately raise it by 20, 30 cents. But shouldn't the NDP do something to curtail that? But it, this is where I think uh, we get very confusing messages, both from the Liberals and even from the media at times. We believe in a mixed economy. We believe in a free market. Uh, you can imagine the outrage and the outpouring there would be if the government set a maximum amount that could be charged, right? And, but we are monitoring it. We're working with the federal government. Some of it is under federal government jurisdiction as well. So we've got to take a look at it. But you've also got to turn our uh, energy towards the people who are actually doing this. What is the justification for four gas stations on King George Boulevard but, but then charging a difference of 20, 30 cents? Absolutely. And so then we turn it back around to you saying that, well, you're the government. You're in power. What concrete steps have the government taken to curtail or to fix that situation? Well, first of all, uh, when you take a look at the government setting the price at which oil could be sold, or let's say a bread could be sold, or your clothes can be sold immediately, there's going to be an outcry. This government is a socialist government. Look <clears> at them. Now they want to control everything. So this is one where we, we, have, to we have to monitor and we have to work with the federal government. But we also have to have good discussions with the oil companies as well 
and see what is happening and find a solution. Now for the public right now, yeah. and it's the same in my household, they just want the problem fixed. Correct. And they want the problem fixed. And I'm always amazed that it's always summer, which is the busiest driving period for families, when the gas prices go up. Interesting. That's when we say it's the free enterprise, right? It's uh, That's what's working. And uh, the question I always have to ask uh, Andrew Wilkinson is, does he really believe in free enterprise? Uh, you know, look, the free market? Or does he actually support that? Because I'm getting very mixed messages when I read their posts. They almost seem to want uh, John Hogan to come and do something that's not within his purview to do. But what is within his purview to do is to have those discussions and find a solution. We're, we're concerned because we know how big affordability is. We have done so much to address affordability. Under the previous government, housing market went out of range. You know that. People earning $100,000 a year today are finding it difficult to qualify for a mortgage. And the money laundering that went on, that was ignored, was unheard of. The amount of money people are saving from the uh, tolls not being there, MSP premiums not being paid, and free uh, tuition for adult education, free ESL training for children who are uh, graduating out of care, free post-secondary, extra seats created at post-secondary, thousands of apprenticeship programs, and you know, looking for value added when we're using public tax dollars. So we're uh, trying to address affordability from a different, uh, many different ways, including the first, the first social program brought in for decades and decades, and that's childcare. So, uh, Ginny, I'm a local realtor in this area, um, and uh, actually I'm in your writing. Um, and, you know, one of the things that really touches a nerve with me is the stress test. Uh, the Liberals created the stress test. Uh, people blame the NDP very easily. Um, conservatives stay quiet because they're letting these two parties figure it out. Uh, where does your, where does, where do you, your party and where do you stand on the stress test? Uh, two percentage points over the, the guarantee, even on fixed rates, which really makes no logical sense. Is there anything that the NDP uh, in the federal elections is going to announce, or even locally, can anything be done about it? It would be a very foolish minister of uh, British Columbia that would start making announcements what the federal NDP is going to do. So I will let our leader, Jigmeet Singh, uh, make those announcements. But uh, there is a lot of confusion, even among some realtor friends of mine, who seem to think that the stress test is a BC stress test. That stress test was put in by the federal government. Correct. And it was done actually to protect the buyers because we know what happened in the US when people were actually borrowing more than the houses were worth, especially when the interest rates went up. And uh, so a lot of them um, went bankrupt and lost their homes. So in order to protect the buyers, they built in the stress test when the interest rates were really low. And what the federal government's going to do with that, I don't know. And I'm going to let the three federal parties, four federal parties, work on that one together. But for us here in British Columbia, it is about making housing more affordable. In the next uh, three years, we're spending $9 billion, $9 billion to address the housing shortage. This is provincially? This is provincially. This is money that we're putting in because we see it as a priority to build more social housing, to build more affordable housing, to build more rentals to support that. Because we know that housing isn't a luxury. Housing is a necessity. And I often have to say, we know that people have become multi-millionaires out of the real estate market when the prices went up like that. It was like a hockey stick curve. It was. Right? I can remember putting a bid in on a house and I was told I should bid 20,000 more than the listed price. And I didn't want to, but I did it. But that house sold for 90,000 more than the listed price, which was more than the assessed value. So at that time, people made lots of money. And now there's been a little bit of an adjustment, as you know, only a small one, where the prices might have gone down by about 50,000. Depending on the value of the property. Depending on value of the property. But that's so tiny. And then people say the sky is falling. But I want to say to realtors and to my friends in the real estate and in development, 
You can only sell houses that people can afford to buy. A lot of people got themselves into a lot of debt in order to get into the market. And in our South Asian community, people manage because they have multi-generational families. They pool their resources together. But I can tell you, I'm talking to more and more people who are coming in to see me, who are feeling they are drowning under debt. And the amount of mental health pressure on people right now is huge. But the desire to own a home is absolutely there. Yeah. Let's talk more local here. Um, <clears throat> so Highway 99, uh, the previous government spent $80 million um, on getting the, the, the bridge ready, uh, 10 lane bridge as they claim. Uh, the NDP comes into power, stalls the project. Uh, now there is that, as you're driving on 99, you can see on the left side of the road going from here to Vancouver, there is this pile of dirt sitting on the left side. That's with the $80 million of dirt sitting there. Um, NDP says we'll replace the bridge with a two-lane bridge, but we have to first review it more. There's been a lot of reviewing already been done. Uh, more is being done now. I'm not sure how much can we, do we really need. My wife uses that route every day to drop her daughter to school and come back, and, and she has nothing good to say about that commute. So what is the NDP going to do about it? What, are, what, are, what is your stand on it? I would like to know that, and for the record. Thank you very much. And uh, I think, uh, first of all, what the Liberal government did was make lots of uh, photo op announcements without doing their due diligence and without getting all the engineering reports and everything else that was needed and without going through the regional mayors. We have a local regional mayors uh, council that comes up with a plan for public transit. It includes roads, bridges, highways, all of this. And what we had said, even when we were running to form government is that we would support the mayor's plan and the mayor's plan did not include a 10 lane bridge and nor did even the mayor of richmond and i know the people on this side of the bridge would tunnel were definitely for it but really when we look at it when you look at the way highway 99 is all you would have done by putting a 10 lane bridge is shifted the parking lot from this side of the tunnel to the other side of the tunnel. Because once you get a few kilometers down the road, it's the same narrow roads and it's bridges. You got to go through two more bridges for which there was no plan by the provincial government for the next decade or so. So it didn't seem to be making too much sense. So we brought in experts and they didn't start from scratch. They took the reports that were there and then they expanded on those and the minister will be making an announcement uh, in the near future. We do realize something has to be done because there is a parking lot there, but just not your wife. I've had to commute that because I worked at the BCTF and I know what it can be like. But, but what it make, how would it make sense to replace, or from what I understand, is, is gonna be a two-lane bridge with a two-lane tunnel. Uh, to me, that like is not looking forward to the future, and that, that's going to continue the gridlock. Because a lot of people, yes, you're right about Vancouver, but a lot of people do uh, exit out in Richmond and uh, you know and, and beyond. And, but and Richmond doesn't have the infrastructure in place to take that either. So, what we've got to do is instead of making announcements that are good for votes, and I used to say this when I was an MP, we need to start making evidence-based decisions. Mm -hmm. Make decisions based on data. Make your analysis. Listen to the experts. None of us. I'm not an expert on traffic mobility. One of my siblings is in Europe. He did a lot of work on that area. I'm not. So we have to trust the professionals to come up with the best plan. And we have to have a plan that the mayors will support as well. And only recently I heard the mayor of Delta, the new mayor of Delta, who actually looked at all the different options and was leaning towards the proposals being put forward by government because he also must have realized that moving the gridlock from one side of the tunnel to the other side doesn't solve a problem, doesn't solve a problem. So, but we've also got to start taking a look at what else are we going to do? Just building more roads, more bridges isn't going to solve the problem. We've also got to take a look at what are we doing to get people out of their cars and into public transit. And that's where we've got to look at the public transit options for that corridor as well. Um, <clears throat> Justin Trudeau and uh, the SNC-Lavalin uh, scandal, what do you predict this October elections are coming up? 
uh, how do you see the future? Uh, NDP, conservatives, um, liberals, uh, where would you like to settle? देखो पहला तो मैं एक गल कहनी है बहुत खुशी हुई भी फैडरल सरकार ने अप्रैल में सैक हैरीटेज मंथ डिक्लेयर कर दिता असी भी किया तो जलियानवाल बाग का भी प्रोकलमेन किया बहुत ही जरूरी काम है क्योंकि वह साड़ी आजादियों जुड़े है जी तो जी देन सा कैनेडा हैगी भी जुड़े है सो इस कैनेडा के जो कैनेडा अज है जेडे लोग इंडिया तो आए थे उस वक्त इंडिया आई सी पाकिस्तान तो है नहीं चलो पहला सौ साल पहला आए थे जेडे भी लोग आए थे उन्होंने ठंड में लकड़िया चुक चुक के नंगे पैरी जा जा के बहुत मेहनत करके इतने अपने लिए घर बनाया तो उन्होंने कुर्बानियां भी बहुत कितिया सू उन्हों सदा ही सलूट करना चाहिए उन्होंने योध्या तो साड़िया भैन भी जिन्होंने इन बड़ी कुरबानियां करके साडे इतने दरवाजे खोले तो असी अज आ सब कुछ इंजॉय कर सकते हैं जो तुम गल सोचिए भी फैडरल इलैक्शन की होगा मैं तो एक निकी जी स्टोरी दसती हाँ जो मेरे डैडी ने मैं दसी सी जो मैं छोटी जी होंगी सी वो कहें होंगे सके बेटा डेमोक्रेसी बहुत ही कमाल की चीज़ है डेमोक्रेसी विच दी डिफरेंट पार्टीज जिन्हों की डिफरेंट आइडियोलॉजी होंगी अपना पक्ष लोगों के मोहरे रखते ईडियोलॉजी तो लड़ो अपना पक्ष मोहरे रखो दूसरे की विरोधता करो पर जो इलैक्शन हो जाए वनू एक्सैप्ट करो सैलीब्रेट करो करके जोड़े वोटर्स होंगे देर ऑलवेज राइट एंड जोड़े वोटर्स होंगे आप प्रिडिक्ट नहीं कह सकते भी आ सरकार बनाऊगा जो सरकार बनाऊ मैं तो कहनी हाँ उस दिन ही पता लगना आ जो वोटा काउंट हो जो है भी फैडरल सरकार के एस एन सी का इशू चलते होर भी इशू बहुत आने हैं तो दूसरिया पार्टियां भी आने मैं तो हरेक यो कहूँगी जो भी अपनी वोट पानी है वोट तो बहुत कीमती है ये लोगों ने कुरबानियां दिखाई जाना दिखाई है वह इस्तेमाल करो पर इस्तेमाल इस तरह ना करो किसी ने थोड़ा किया है इनू वोट पा दो अपनी रिसर्च करो ईडियोलॉजी देखो सिर्फ लफ्ज ना पढ़ो ये भी देखो भी किया भी की है तो दूसरे की गलते ना मानो भी आ गैस प्राइस का जॉन होगन बधाई देता है इदा की गल थोड़ी आप भी सोचनी चाहिए एक सेंट ना तो तीस सेंट बधा दिता होर किसी ना उंगली करो उंगलियां तो जाए right, right. फॉर द व्यूअर्स ऑफ द टाइम्स ऑफ कैनेडा दिस इज आर होम नाउ इन कैनेडा वी हैव कम फ्रॉम मैनी पार्ट्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड Uh, both from Europe, from Asia, from Africa. Our job in Canada is to make Canada a much more inclusive society. Halle vi aithe racism hai gaya. Halle vi amiri kripi da fasla hai gaya. Halle vi log kente abhi ona nu equality nahi mili. Sada farj banta hai asi har ek the hakka nahi ladiye. The naale is samaj nu ek baagwan nu nahiye. जो असी अपने गार्डन जाइए बाग में जाइए आ उ रंग बिरंगे फुल होंगे असी कभी नहीं क्या ये फुल दूसरे फुल न जचता नहीं तो नीले तो गुलाब फुल है ना लाल फुल कट्ठे कर दिए दोनों ही जचते हैं इस ही तरह असी इस कैनेडा ने भी एक बाग बनाई है जिथे साडे बच्चे रंग बिरंगे जितों भी आए हैं इतने जमे आ बहरों आए आ उन्हों का रंग काला आ पीला आ ब्राउन आ जोड़े रंग के मर्जी भी है वो फुलों वागू खिल उन्होंने सपने पूरे हो तो असी इस कैनेडा में रह के पूरी कोशिश करिए भी ऐसा समाज बने जिथे साडे बच्चे आने वाले दिन आजादी अपने सपने पूरे भी कर दूसर की मदद भी कर असी थोड़ा भुल गए हैं इतने आके क्योंकि जो असी इतने पैर जमाए थे सूँ बहुत सारे ने सा मदद की साडा भी फर्ज बनता हूँ भी असी सिर्फ जिन्होंने कुरबानियां कीतिया से उन्होंने ना तो मेले ना रखिए मेले रख भी चाहिए है पर गां जी उन्होंने सू सिक्ख्या दिखती सी और भी चलीए तो समाज में सुधारीए क्योंकि हरेक इंसान का पूरा हक मिलता है उन्होंने भी इतने आके बराबरता मिले ओपरचुनिटीज मिले घर लैन का भी मौका मिले थैंक यू वेरी मच अगेन रियली अप्रीशिएट योर टाइम